Welcome to Transformative Principle. I'm your host, Jethro Jones, and you can follow me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. Hey, guess what? I've got a book coming out. How exciting is that? It's called School X, and it's all about helping you as a principal be a designer of your school and not just a manager. So I hope you'll check it out. You can download the free chapter at schoolx.me. So just go to schoolx.me to download the first free chapter. And once you get it, hit reply to the email and tell me what you think. Looking forward to sharing that with you. That's schoolx.me. This episode is brought to you by John Cat Educational, a professional development publisher serving as the global leader in combining both research and practice in all materials. Find timely PD publications to support yourself and your faculty by visiting them online at us.johncatbookshop.com. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am so excited to have Marty Sivik and Tanya Lyon on the podcast today. This is episode 348, and you can get all the show notes and links to whatever we talk about at jethrojones.com slash podcast slash episode 348. So uh, Marty Sivik is going to be the assistant principal of East High School uh, starting this year, and Tanya Lyon is the talent development coordinator, and they both work for Mankato Area Public Schools in Mankato, Minnesota. Welcome, Marty and Tanya. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Tanya, would you like to start out and give a little bit more background about what it is that you do for Mankato Area Public Schools? Sure, Jethro. Um, My position is talent development coordinator, as you said, and that is an umbrella term for what is conventionally known as gifted and talented services. Uh, However, I would say that we are a broader model of that than what is traditionally thought of in gifted and talented education. And so for the past six years, I've been serving in that role and uh, probably most germane to this conversation is some of the work that we've done um, in taking our district from a common problem throughout the nation around gifted and talented services to be more inclusive, to diversify programming, and uh, to upscale our programming to make sure that students get what they need in our program. And so as we talk about what we've done with our math program, it's set against a larger backdrop of really redesigning what we meant by gifted and talented services within our district and also planning something much more inclusive in its delivery model and its rigor and its resources. Yeah, very good. And uh, Marty, would you give just a little bit more background about yourself, please? Sure thing. So throughout my career, I've been a high school Spanish teacher um, and then worked at the university level, preparing teachers of all content areas, K through 12, and then Um, served as instructional technology coordinator, professional development coordinator, and most recently interim director of teaching and learning prior to taking the position of East or East High School's assistant principal. And uh, as Tanya spoke to what's relevant really to this conversation is really my work as professional development coordinator and interim director of teaching and learning partnering with Tanya and the programming her department offers to assure that students have access to highly rigorous and accessible curriculum that has no ceiling in spite of the student situation and or the instructor's familiarity or comfort with content that would go beyond what uh, would traditionally be accessible in uh, a course for that particular student. And that my role would have involved working with Tani, partnering with her to make sure teachers have what they need, build their capacity to deliver materials either in a different way and or with other resources, and then assuring as interim director of teaching and learning that those services are being delivered throughout the district in a guaranteed and viable manner. Yeah, very good. That sounds awesome. So I really like that idea of helping students have access to high quality instruction with no ceiling. I think that is so important. So let's start there. And let's start first by defining, I think most people who are listening are probably familiar with this idea, but what does it mean to have instruction with no ceiling? That's a great question. Um, I think really um, the way we've defined it as a district is that we increase the complexity 
of um, the work that is being done because um, when you increase the complexity around real world problems, ill structured problems, um, even the you know standards that we have in Minnesota or the the Common Core standards, the when you increase the complexity of those, you really are able to take the ceiling as high as it needs to go. And that ultimately, um, that philosophy is ultimately what has really guided what we've done in our program and the professional development that Marty was talking about that we've done and in selecting resources that will um, challenge our students and provide them what they need as we look to a future in education where we may not know exactly what jobs they're going to have, but the students are going to need to have that um, strong problem-solving background um, and be able to really wrangle with very complex questions. And I would contrast that with what might be familiar to a lot of people who are listening, and that would be more. So sometimes synonymous for many, synonymous with rigorous or high-level or ceilingless work would be more, more math problems, more books to read, just another, more worksheets to do, more problems to solve. And uh, rather than more, this is different and complex. So I might take a topic deeper and further and require creative, innovative, reflective thought versus just more material on the same in order to fill time. I like that. I think that's a, a good way to look at it. This idea of different and complex instead of more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what that actually looks like in practice, because um, it sounds like a an exceptional amount of extra work for um, a teacher in the classroom to do that than to just say, do this other worksheet, do this other worksheet. How do you how do you teach teachers to to take a different and complex instead of more approach? And therein lies one of the challenges that we face year after year <laughs> within <laughs> when this within this type of work. That's right. <laughs> um, but which is um, the right work to be doing. And um, it is also the most um, meaningful work when students get excited about that. So um, there are a couple things, I think a couple prongs that I can add to that um, discussion. And one would be is we've had to do a fair amount of um, professional development around what it what giftedness is and what it means and characteristics of it in um, what we see as traditional uh, groups, but also characteristics in um, groups that have been underrepresented in our programming. And again, I'm not just talking about what's going on in Mankato, but this is a nationwide issue. I have a, a national presence, partly because of that, that grant that um, I worked on that I talked about at the beginning of the program. Um, and so I've, I've worked with a fair number of school districts from around the nation who are struggling with the same same question. And so that that giftedness background in how we see it in uh, culturally diverse students, linguistically diverse students, economically diverse students, and twice exceptional students who have special education needs and also gifted education needs. Um, there's a whole body of work that has been done on how you can see giftedness in those in those student groups as well. And it really starts with what those needs are. Um, because then when you build professional development and when you build a system around those needs, you build that clear cause effect programming response about this is why we're doing it. And so it really comes back to building that why. Why do students need this? Why do why is this resource better? Why is this instructional support uh, approach better? And so that's really one prong is coming back to the why. And then another prong is really coming back to the how. And um, the most important thing about the how is making sure that um, it's okay for teachers to understand um, that they don't have to have all the answers, that they have to provide a framework for learning and not necessarily be the sage on the stage. Mm -hmm. And that's where I would have gone immediately with the question. So I'm really glad that you built the why and, and the understanding that we provided with professional development for teachers to see uh, the importance of providing opportunity for kids, but then the how can't be adding something more to the mm -hmm. teacher's plate without fundamentally changing the way that instruction happens. And so creating a programmatic system so students can rotate in and out of groups where their needs have been assessed and then can be uh, those, those the needs-based 
instruction can be utilized in a small group setting and, and, and tied into the large group lesson, but that the kids are rotating in and out of groups that meet their needs at their level with resources for which the Y has been built. So students get what they need when they need it uh, with like or ability level peers. Mm-hmm. And they those group groups are flexible and kids are going to move in and out of different groups based on what they know, what they don't yet know, and what they already know. Well, and I like how you, you also talk about how it's the how can't just be adding more to the teacher's plate. You know, it's it's not just you know, doing more things than you've done before as a teacher. It's not, it's not that either. Just like we're not expecting kids to just do more, we're not expecting that from teachers either. And what I appreciate about that is that we have to change how we deliver the professional development. We have to change our expectations of what it's going to look like for them um, and different things like that. What were some of those changes that you saw um, for how you delivered or what you expected from teachers as you started down this new path? So one thing that comes to mind right away when you ask that question is we needed to make sure that our teachers had a very deep understanding of their academic standards. Because if I'm going to ask students or we're going to ask them, the teachers, to do different things with different groups of kids, the teachers need a solid enough understanding of their standards to know what standards are being met by which delivery. (laughs) Does that make sense? And so if I'm running a small group with highly complex content and asking students to create, I need to know which standards, grade level standards have been mastered to which level, regardless of the grade level material that the other group is doing. Mm -hmm. Yep. And that was one piece. Well, and when we talk about taking away things um, so that it's not more part of what we really have taken taken away and tried to take away is that idea of being a sage on a stage Mm -hmm. and um, having to have all of the answers. And that, that is so deeply ingrained that um, the, uh, that pattern has been so deeply ingrained in uh, people throughout education um, that, that a teacher needs to be a sage on the stage. And so um, part of what we do is we make sure that we do a lot around uh, what does collaboration look like? Um, because a lot of the resources that we have chosen, including Beast Academy, really um, part of what becomes electrifying for kids about them and uh, what they enjoy most about them is the ability to collaborate with their peers around them. And sometimes the kids work independently too, but really that process of talking things through and problem solving that doesn't, even in our elementary programming, that doesn't... um, uh, necessarily happen all in the space of one day that students might be working on a concept and a problem for multiple days in a row and have their insights, you know, uh, come, you know, on the bus or in their physical education class or whatever, because they've thought so deeply about the problems. And a part of that with the resource selection, particularly around Beast Academy, and then an ELA resource that we have called Mentor Network allowed students the ability to work independently and in small groups with or without their teacher and would allow the teacher to assign certain tasks at a certain rate or around a certain concept. And the the students can operate peer-to-peer in small group and consult their teacher with questions or areas that they may get stuck. And the resource selection, again, of Beast Academy and Mentor Network allowed that type of facilitation where the teacher wasn't the sage on the stage. So we needed to create an a space for the teacher to not have to be the center. And then the other thing that I I would say that we've run up against in the the redesign of our programming is that the, that idea that people want um, gifted and talented services to be a pullout program. And um, we are not a pullout program. We are push in program. And part of the reason for that is that our broader framework as a talent development program, because um, we are able to, handle a range of needs and as Marty mentioned uh, ceilingless curriculum so um, so really we start when we planned we plan for you know what is mastery at the standards level all the way up to what is the highest uh, form of challenge that we can envision 
um, at this time. And then as students challenge that notion, <laughs> uh, we redesign what that looks like. Yes, and so because we, they do. Because they do. <laughs> yep, they're brilliant, right? Just students have so much capacity. And so um, we, we really, um, in that talent development model, um, keep the expectations high. And the more we train teachers, what happens is the more students that they're able to figure out how, how they belong and how they can challenge those students through these rich resources. And so um, in any classroom where we are delivering what we would call a formalized talent development service, there are usually other kids who are pulled into the programming because they've demonstrated a need for that challenge. And as Marty was saying, sometimes those in those flexible groups, kids might be there just for you know, like this particular unit, and they might go back to core instruction. Um, and some of our t- our students who are getting formal formalized services may need work on core instruction, and then they go into that that group for a while until they have mastered that concept. Yeah, that's really good. You know, one of the things that that I've been working on for years as a principal is is helping my teachers move from that sage on the stage approach. Um, and now as I'm consulting and supporting principals, my focus is getting principals to move from the manager approach to the designer approach, which is a very similar thing. You know, for a long time, school leaders have thought that they needed to solve everybody's problems, put out all the fires, be constantly available. And the reality is, is that when we, we see the same thing, when we empower kids to, find their own solutions and collaborate and work together to solve their problems. They absolutely have the ability to do that. We see the same thing with principals as well, that when they start moving from being a manager to being a designer of their school, they, they start taking a different approach, much like what you have described here. And I think that that is, that's so important for us to pay attention to um, because it's easy to think, well, I've got to do everything. And the reality is, Nobody really has to do everything because a lot of things, one, we could just stop doing them and that would be fine. And two, um, we can empower those who, who are our teachers or our students to be the ones to come up with the ideas of how to, how to do things. And I think your example of kids, you know, redefining what mastery looks like because, um, because they're so able to be successful, um, on their own is really powerful. John Cat Educational supports high quality teaching and learning by providing publications that are research based, practical, and focused on the key topics proven essential in today's and tomorrow's schools. The latest John Cat publications include a book whose bold, transformative ideas amaze and infuriate people around the world, according to one reviewer, a title from Global Leaders in Curriculum Planning, Practice, and Retrieval, one book that says Stop Talking and Start Doing with regard to teacher well being and much more. These books used by educators of all roles across North America and worldwide amplify fresh, engaging voices with practical strategies to create transformative change. Learn more in our show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast. Let's talk a little bit about the results that you've seen and what that looks like. And, um, I, I'm not one who thinks that everything should be based on standardized test results, but I know that that's how a lot of decisions are made. So I think that that's important to acknowledge. So let's talk a little bit about the on paper success that you've seen, but then also let's talk about the success you've seen from the kids in their, uh, in their mannerisms, in their determination, in their um, non standardized test measurable skills as well. That's a great question. I didn't come with my numbers today. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. I but I do know that uh, Beast Academy has had a profound impact on um, on our numbers in in many ways. And then in some ways, it's um, it's not even comparable to what kids do on the NWEA. And so it's really hard to measure. Um, I use it's really hard to measure progress. And I use NWEA for measures of academic progress. That's the testing system that we use. We don't call it measures of academic progress because we're Mankato area public schools and it gets confusing with math and maps. Yeah. We call it NWEA here. Everybody else in the world that's listening, you might call this map testing. We don't do that because that's our district name. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
So we do know that it has impacted our kids. Um, Beast Academy is doing um, a pretty in-depth analysis of how that um, how the implementation has impacted our students. Um, and so we are eagerly awaiting some of those numbers. Uh, but I can tell you that um, when we first looked at those numbers, um, we had a, a, a fifth grade class that we implemented Beast Academy with, and the students had been in talent development services, the formalized services for two years prior to that. Um, under a different math program. And so after year one of using Beast Academy, um, what what I did was I um, reviewed all of the kids and their scores. And this was a cohort that we could see district-wide um, from kindergarten on. And, and um, the, one of the most glaring things that jumped out at me um, and some of the talent development team as we looked at this was the number of 99th percentiles. And so up until the four years prior to Beast Academy, we had a handful of 99th percentiles throughout the district. Um, the year that we implemented Beast Academy, um, I think we more than um, quadrupled the number of 99th percentiles. Um, and we went up to like from typically like around four or so, and four to six maybe, to um, 24 throughout the district. And um, that was probably one of the most glaring things that we noticed um, that happened on the test. And I talk about some of the direct ways that um, Beast Academy has impacted our, our, our test scores would be, it's just such a rich and rigorous curriculum that students have to use their logic, their reasoning skills, their problem solving skills, and really go deep into it. Um, there's there's a high ceiling if we take the first, even second grade Beast Academy materials and and look at them. Um, we have things that can challenge adults. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So let me let me talk real quick about um, something. I just want to tie a couple of things together because people have been listening to my podcast for a long time. Know that I've been preaching what you're preaching for for many years and. I saw some very similar results from a from a brand new teacher, first year teacher who was not getting uh, these kids were just struggling and were pulled out because they were doing so poorly in math. They had an extra math class to support them. Um, and this first year teacher came in and she pretty much focused essential essentially on mindset and and thinking that you can do better and collaboration and it's okay to get a wrong answer and that that's showing that your brain is growing when you do that. And, and she saw very similar results to what you're talking about where, except it was on the low end of the spectrum. So instead of like the high kids, you know, having even more kids being high, um, they, we had low kids who were now showing proficiency on the NWA map test, um, you know, growing two to three grade levels in a, in a single year which, you know, before was completely unheard of, but it's not about her, her curriculum or Beast Academy. It, it's about um, the idea of the teacher not being the sage on the stage anymore and helping kids work through the problems to figure things out on their own. That's the commonality that I'm seeing between your, um, your approach and this teacher's approach. And it's amazing because it can happen anywhere. And it's funny because we don't do those things that we know work because they're not quite as easy as just having the teacher adopt a scripted curriculum, which my teacher didn't. And, uh, Beast Academy is not that either, but it's a way to help change the narrative. So let's, let's now talk. We've seen some academic paper growth. Let's talk about some of the other things that you noticed, uh, with kids who, who were in the program and how they improved in ways that aren't measured on tests typically. I would, I'll talk about my own kids. <laughs> I have a, I have a 2B fourth grader and a 2B fifth grader. So they just finished third and fourth grades. And um, one, well, for my, for my older child, it's not surprising that she would want to continue working on Beast Academy all summer long, just because that's who she is. And she loves to connect with her friends that way. And um, they have maintained since distance learning, they have maintained uh, chat groups to stay in touch around not only just in, in conversation as friends, but in relationship to their work in Beast Academy and in Mentor Network. 
Um, but my son, the younger one, is the one who, because of the resource, because of Beast Academy, the complexity with which it approaches solving conceptual mathematical understanding in, in contrast to rote, kill and drill, skill based learning, um, he eagerly logs in and participates in exercises and activities now in the summer when he could be swimming in the pool. <laughs> <laughs> Just anecdotally. And Tanya has used the expression tickle tickles your brain. Like it's an activity that tickles your brain and our brains love that. It's it's learning, it's growth, it's opportunity, it's new, it's different, it's not a dead end, yes, right, wrong answer. It's a let's figure this out and understand it. And the way that Beast Academy has designed their materials, their resources, and their questioning is in such a way that kids brains are tickled, interest is peaked, and they come back for more. And on a broader scale, we see that all over the district. Mm -hmm. um, we have when when students don't get access to Beast Academy, um, they they wilt in in many ways. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's not just access to it, but it is also with the approach, Jethro, that you were talking about, um, with the access to rigor, the collaboration, the it's really a different mindset of approaching education and it's giving them appropriate resources to, to do that. And um, I don't know how familiar you are with Beast Academy, um, but Beast Academy is, um, is done really in two, two parts for lack of a better word here. Um, the first part is that students read this guidebook that has four beasts who are um, talking about solving math problems, and they are going to an academy, yes. hence the name Beast Academy. Oh. And all four of those um, monsters have different ways of solving problems, which models the collaborative process yes. for kids. And they talk about, you can figure it out this way, or you can figure it out this way, or you can figure it out this way. Which gives permission to not have a black or white right or wrong answer, where... Mm -hmm. And I witnessed that with my own children because my daughter, I've told Tony this before, will say, well, this particular classmate is really good at X, Y, or Z. And this other classmate in my group is really good at this. And we need each other to do the work. And so they learn from those beasts mm -hmm. that they need each other. And there are people who have different skill sets and different gifts to approach learning from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And they utilize each other's strengths. It's really a strength-based approach mm -hmm. in the small group. Set up. And our program design, thanks mm -hmm. to Tanya and her department, is such that um, takes advantage of that structure where kids can really utilize each other's mm -hmm. strengths. Yep. And then the second part beyond the guidebook is a, a series of really brilliant scaffolded problems that start really accessibly for students and just get deeper, 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 richer, richer, richer. Um, and some of our students, you know, we have students. Um, who can work all the way up to, you know, kind of all the way through that depth or um, into that really, really substantial challenge. And then some students get partway through and they, you know, you see them hit their, their stop point. And so those problems, the design of the program um, was part of what we really liked too, in terms of the ceilingless um, possibilities. And we are watching, I mean, we do know that Beast Academy has a ceiling. Mm -hmm. We haven't had any kids who have tapped out of it yet, um, but we're getting close and that's going to be really exciting when it happens. Yeah, that's very cool. Very cool. Well, um, as people have been listening, know uh, Beast Academy, uh, Art of Problem Solving has been the sponsor of the podcast before. And um, and talking with them, they said, well, here's a district who's really doing some great stuff. You should um, talk with them. So I'm glad we had the chance to to chat about that um, today. Can I uh, the one? last question. Sorry, Jethro. The, the last. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And you said one thing in, in relation yes, a little bit about what you were saying earlier about student self-perception and ability stamina in math, in math problem solving. Um, we had partnered last year in collaboration with Art of Problem Solving slash Beast Academy with West Ed to conduct a research project around student self-efficacy and self, well, that is self-belief around their ability in math and, and with it and stick it, sticking with it. Um, and due to COVID-19, we were not able to complete the, the final part of that, but we will be completing that research project. So those results as well in relationship to 
highly rigorous and complex curriculum will come out sometime next year. And that should be something that uh, listeners could, could watch for as well. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, definitely. When you, when you see that forward that along and I'll send it out to my email list as well, that would be, that would be fantastic. Um, so the last question that I ask on every episode is what is one thing that a principal can do this week to be a transformative principal like you and Tanya will let you go first. Oh, that's a great question. I, I am not a principal, though I have my principal's license. Um, my work is really around um, supporting people, and I think principals could do this too. Um, principals in our district do it um, as well, but really supporting the teachers in um, making a, a mindset shift. I, I'm not going to, you know, gloss over the fact that it's really scary when you work with some of these these kids and you see what they're capable of and you think, I'm supposed to provide a framework for this, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that, um, I think that that affirmation around the thing, the themes that we've talked about in our, in our, our interview here, which would be that collaboration, the removal of the stage on the stage. Um, I would, I haven't framed it this way in terms of the podcast yet, but, um, the relinquishing of control over student thinking and, um, work and um, problem solving, that they need time away from their teacher to really wrestle with this. Their conversations can be very different uh, when they are working by themselves than when their teacher is listening to it. And um, some of those mindset pieces um, that we don't want to facilitate perfectionism and how important that struggle is in um, in creating self-concept as you were talking about Jethro. And so really, really designing to use your word, um, a system that, that allows teachers and affirms teachers who take those risks because those, those classrooms sometimes look messier, um, and less organized. They, they are organized, um, learning, but they may be loud and they may be, messy and um they they may not look what like what people think of traditional classrooms to be yeah very good and marty what would you add to that you know i very much in line with what tanya was saying there at the end <clears throat> I, I would encourage principals working with teachers who can't can't see what's possible or have a hard time changing their structure their format their instructional design whatever it is simply to ask the question, well, if it couldn't look like that, what else could it look like? If it couldn't be like that, what else might it be like? And if that goal is more collaborative time for those students, uh, more critical thinking discussions in small groups for those students, level-based or interest-based access to content by small groups, whatever the goal may be to change it up, simply the question, well, if it's not like that, what else could it be like? to encourage reflective thought that's outside of the box and encourage change. I just want to add the result is transformative. Yes. Good one. I like that. Very nicely done, Tanya. <laughs> well, thank you so much uh, for being a guest on transformative principle. And thank you for listening to transformative principle. Again, you can get show notes at jethrojones.com slash podcast slash episode three, four, eight. And thank you very much to Tanya and Marty for being part of the program today. Thank you to our valued partner, John Cat Educational. If you are a leader looking to make transformative change by providing yourself and your leaders and teachers with professional development that is research-based and rigorous, yet easy to digest and full of practical strategies, check out the latest publications from John Cat. Visit us.johncatbookshop.com to find information on bulk orders or learn much more in our show notes. You can also use the code transformative to save a bundle at us.johncatbookshop.com.